Bob Pulver. In this episode, I'm joined by Edie Goldberg, author, future of work expert, and chairman of the Sherm Foundation. Edie emphasizes the importance of talent marketplaces and skills-based hiring to create equal opportunities based on skills rather than connections. She advocates for implementing systems that facilitate diversity, equity, and inclusion, and highlights the need for skills assessments to unlock the potential in diverse talent pools. Additionally, we discuss the challenges of internal talent marketplaces, the necessity of a holistic talent ecosystem strategy, and the role of AI in improving decision-making, as well as operational efficiency. As you'll hear in each episode, I ask all my esteemed guests what they recommend to elevate one's AIQ, so look out for Edie's recommendations. Hope you enjoy my chat with Edie. Hello, welcome to another episode of Elevate Your AIQ. I'm your host, Bob Pulver. With me today is Edie Goldberg. She is a future of work expert and author and chairman of the board of the Sherm Foundation. She's got a lot of titles, wears a lot of hats. Edie, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's the ultimate portfolio career. I just do a lot of different things. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That's, uh, that's how we do it. So Edie, why don't you just... Give our listeners just a quick rundown of maybe some how you got to be wearing all the hats that you wear today. Sure. So, you know, kind of way back, I was a small child now. And I have a PhD in industrial and organizational psychology. So I kind of call that my grounding. So I'm very much a evidence based practitioner, if you will. But I have been an HR management consultant for I think about 35 years now, uh, and I've had my own business for 23 of those. So started off with boutique management consulting firm, worked for Towers Perrin. I was a global thought leader in the human capital practice. Uh, and then I started doing my own thing, if you will. Um, and my work really focuses on helping companies to attract, engage, retain um, talent and driving uh, performance of the organization. I really kind of got into focusing on the future of work. I think it was back in 2016. Uh, I was working with a big group of amazing, um, mostly CHROs, some academics and, and thought leaders really thinking about the future of work and how do we in HR need to think about um, approaching work differently and meeting the needs of our companies differently. And that has obviously infused a lot of what I do. But then I wear all, so that's like my day job, if you will. On, um, you know, I, I do a lot of keynote speaking based on books that I've written or articles that I write. I advise three HR tech companies and I am the chair of the board of the Sherm Foundation. So lots of hats, lots of different things to do and I'm never bored. So your book Inside Gig is I think what first uh, brought us together. I had done quite a bit of, I guess, internal crowdsourcing in my days at, at IBM before there was a, a gig economy. But I think when you and Kelly wrote that book and we started, I guess it opened my eyes to the fact that this is this is really happening. Like people are waking up. You know, I never had a role, an official HR role, but I was always, you know, playing on the outskirts, covering you know people, process, and technology. And on some level, the, the concept just seems so logical to me. Like, why would you let your people leave and then start all over again, <laughs> recruiting, trying to backfill? If you actually care about your people, why wouldn't you want to see them succeed? And if they're not, you know, achieving what you thought they could, maybe there's some underlying reason. It's not that they're not capable. Maybe it's just not the ideal fit, you know, square peg in the round hole kind of thing. And... Um, so maybe we could just just talk a little bit about that that book in particular. It just it happens to resonate really well with me, and obviously with talent marketplaces as a software platform. You know that's that's still one of the hot areas within HR tech. Yeah, it's like this huge explosion of interest in in internal talent mobility and talent marketplaces. Obviously, the you know the first inkling of this idea really came for me. I was partnering with an outplacement company called Ricemark. Uh, now acquired by Ronstad. And we were looking at, you know, it's kind of ironic and interesting how companies have, you know, employees going out one door and then they're hiring employees in, you know, through the back door. 
And they're not really looking at the skills of their employees to see if they can be repurposed. And that was initially where part of that idea came from. It also came from what I would say, you know, my very personal experiences when I was at Towers Perrin and I was in the human capital practice, but they started a measurement practice. And, you know, I'm an industrial psychologist by training. I had years of statistics and research methods and I was a trained researcher and they were starting projects that were, you know, developing surveys and doing research for company. And I thought, well, I'd like to do that, you know, but we were kind of a siloed organization and I couldn't do that because I was in a different practice area. And, and I thought, well, why not bring joy to my life? Like, why not let me work on that other project? And, and so you start to realize how companies underutilize the talent that they have. And then we started working on this big future of work initiative. Um, and actually, uh, since you mentioned IBM, Diane Gerson, who was then the CHRO at, at IBM was one of the initial leaders of this group. We ultimately called ourselves Create, which was like the global consortium to reimagine HR, employment, um, and, uh, and talent in the enterprise or something like that. Uh, it was a long time ago. And we were thinking about how, how people are going to have to work differently, how work models are changing, how HR and the skill sets within HR need to change. But this idea of skills shifting within the organization and how do we need to change our talent processes? So, Kelly was also part of that group, my co-author, Kelly Stephen Wace. And, you know, she said to me, Edie, you know, I've got this idea. I think, I think I know how we can work differently within my company here, technologies, but it fundamentally disrupts everything that we do about talent. So I need you to help me write a whole new talent operating model for operating this way. And so that's how Kelly and I came together to do this work. And we did it. And it was huge hugely impactful in their organization. We had, we had estimated by people participating in projects outside of their day-to-day -day job, when you calculate the compensation that the company was effectively, if you will, saving by not hiring an external contractor to do that work or hiring another employee, when they only counted projects people were working on outside of their normal P&L, they estimated their cost savings to be $14 million based on the fact that people who are already their employees were contributing to these projects and they were doing it because they were interested in learning new things. They were interested in leveraging skills that they had that they didn't use in their day job or they wanted to apply in a different context. Um, it was something they were passionate and interested about. It was a career they wanted to explore. All these different reasons. And, and then we saw this like massive impact. Employee engagement in the company went way up. This is a, a technology company. So having people contribute on a project from different disciplines was really important for facilitating innovation. So we, we have this really successful thing and we wanted to write about it. And I was gonna originally write an HBR article on this. And one of the editors said, no, 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 no. It's a much bigger story than that. You have to write a book. Um, and so that's how the book, The Inside Gig came about. But Kelly and I were really on a mission to help companies change the way they work and understand how to better, better leverage the talent that they have. And everything that we've done since then has been kind of in service of that mission. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think, I guess one of the things that I've, Notice, and I mean, you would know this better than me, but as much as, you know, so, so Kelly created a uh, hitch, which is now part of ServiceNow, um, but the hitch, the people that followed closely behind hitch was, you know, Fuel50 and, you know, Eightfold and some of these other vendors who created internal talent marketplaces. Despite that, it seems like there's still a lot of organizations who have not uh, taken that approach and, and maybe they have other ways of sort of, managing, you know, internal mobility and skills or whatever. But if you look at what a modern full full featured talent marketplace incorporates, it really is such an amazing hub of intelligence and, and knowledge and 
the way the organization is is working and the skills gaps and you know connections to learning and you know professional development and you know extracurriculars or looking for maybe even looking for mentors or coaches or whatever it just seems like there's such incredible value to be untapped and unleashed how could you not uh, how could you not invest in something like that? I mean, what's holding companies back? Uh, what's holding companies back is a couple things. One is it's kind of a big change in how you operate. Before we move on, I need to let you know about my friend Mark Pfeffer and his show, People Tech. If you're looking for the latest on product development, marketing, funding, big deals happening in talent acquisition, HR, HCM, that's the show you need to listen to. Go to the Work to Find Network, search up People Tech, Mark Pfeffer. You can find him anywhere. And, I, you know, I will admit that most companies implement it strictly for career development purposes. And the gigs people are able to sign up for are on top of their day job. So with people already kind of overworked uh, and stressed out, uh, companies are saying, you know, we can't add on to, to what people are doing. Now, the truth of the matter is, if you look at the employee engagement data, we know that there is a lot of productivity time that's being left on the table because if we're not engaged, we're not as productive. So we do believe that this is a path to greater productivity. And those companies that have implemented it have had that productivity lift within their company. But the other issue, and it's probably the biggest challenge to implementing this, is the mindset of managers who kind of, if you will, covet and hoard their talent and they don't want to share. You know, they don't want to let their employees explore that other opportunity. Now, that's not what employees want. And they're going to go leave your company and go to another job to get that opportunity if you're hoarding them. But you know, this is kind of the ultimate talent strategy for retaining talent, developing talent, increasing productivity by allowing people to choose the work that interests them. In the book, Kelly and I talk about the best way to optimize your talent is to understand what skills people have and what work they're interested in doing and we think that you should, you know, break work into tasks and then move work around for people to operate at their maximum level rather than just simply adding on a development experience, which is, again, I'd say 90% of companies implementing a talent marketplace do it simply to connect people to mentors, to allow people to opt in for development opportunities, explore career options, et cetera. Um, but I think the highest and best use is really around creating organizational agility. So we have a different framework around that. And that's what you get to, you know, uh, see if you read the inside gig. But um, I, I think it's, it's fear of change and the unknown. Um, people also think it's this horribly incredible lift. You know, we talk about the skills-based organization. And everyone thinks you have to change everything to become a skills-based organization. And the answer is you can do a few discrete things that, you know, with AI and machine learning, we can kind of extract a lot of data pretty easily. You're the expert in this, Bob, not me. So I'd like you to follow up on that. But you know, you don't have to do this like two years. How do we define all the skills in our company, you know, project? I think we can pretty easily scrape that data from both people's LinkedIn profiles, their resumes, the work they've done, et cetera. But again, I defer to you. Well, so many thoughts there. Um, the first is to your point about the talent hoarding. I, I think some of that just is about how do you um, incentivize you know, the leadership and, and people managers um, with with new metrics, metrics that are more pointed to the, the success of the people under their, uh, you know, on their teams. And if, if you're all, if everyone on your team is successful, you're, that's a good sign that you're a really effective leader, right? And so 
but you're right. Change is hard and, and that's hard for people. Um, on the AI front, I think one of the things that's interesting is right now, one of the trend trending topics within AI and generative AI is um, what people refer to as agentic workflows. So multiple agents working in concert inside of a given workflow or process where once it's once it knows enough about how how to act, some of it could be still rules based, but maybe you know if if this happens, then do this. But as it gets more intelligent and it knows how an expert in a particular role makes certain non non human human impacting decisions, I'll say, just to because we'll talk about the responsible AI um, concept a little bit later. But even just thinking about how these agents can potentially talk to each other. I think people have, that scares a lot of people because, you know, you're taking away their agency and their decision-making power. You know, they don't have a lot of necessarily a lot of authority, decision-making authority within an organization, but they do, they are empowered to make certain lower level, um, you know, less impactful, you know, decisions, I suppose, just daily decisions. And if you take that away too, then you're going to get some level of backlash. But one of the things I think is interesting is there are, people are coming up with this these concepts where you could basically the average user will interface with one primary agent almost like a general contractor and then that agent will be smart enough to actually know which other agents which agent to tap to execute the task that it thinks that you need executed and so that's pretty that's many steps beyond where we see a lot of the technology these days, but I just think it's interesting that this is going to be able to figure out what is the next best agent to do a certain task. And we're still as humans still trying to catalog each of our individual skills. It almost seems like we're trying to over engineer the human side of things and perhaps not under engineer, but um, assume too much of, of technology. And that's where the responsible AI piece is going to, is going to come in. But I know we're not we're not machines. I mean, we are sort of machines, but we're not we're not digital labor like AI and and automation. And so, and, and I'm not saying they should be traded equal, but it's just interesting to see some parallels in, about the way we think about execution of tasks. And we are wedded to these these old models of you know this is what the role is, and if that role changes more than you know ten percent or whatever, we need to rethink. Maybe we need another person or maybe we need to redefine the role. I mean, I think a lot of what you're talking about gets into some of what John Brudreau and, and Robin um, were talking about in the work deconstruction and things like that. Which is yeah, yeah. I mean, we were all doing this work all around the same time. And to be fair, uh, John Boudreaux was working on this future of work project with Kelly and I. So we, we were all like drinking from the same Kool-Aid at, at, at that time. Um, but uh, yeah, the idea is we can deconstruct tasks. And, you know, I will argue on that job description front, most people, most people's jobs very quickly change from the job description they were hired into. So the idea that, you know, this job description is the be all and end all that really defines the work that I do is crazy because work changes and the team changes and what you need people to do change and it just evolves. And that's okay, but we just think that it's this job description. So I'm 100% with you. I, I think the, this JD job description to, to resume matching thing is, is, is just faulty from the start. Um, and using AI to customize your resume and just apply willy-nilly to any job that looks remotely like, like a match on, on the candidate side is just adding more noise um, to problem. But given your IO psychology background, I mean, do you, I guess I put a lot of stock in um, soft, you know, human skills, because I think those are the more, more durable skills. They're also the skills that allow you to be, you know, adaptable and to sort of, you know, I guess, morph your, your own, you know, capability as your role changes, which like you said, can change within a few <laughs> weeks from what the job description says, if that was accurate, you know, to begin with. So I guess I'm curious how you think about, because the skills, I know we, we talked about this once before, but when we talk about skills-based hiring, 
hiring for potential, this is not just about whether or not you have a four-year degree or not. This is about all the untapped and hidden potential that's out there in in talent pools that aren't getting tapped or to the point we were talking about before, even inside an organization, this person's in a particular role. That's because they were looking for any job out of college. But I mean, do you even know what they're capable of? And so I feel like assessments, you know, both pre-hire and, you know, um, talent assessments with once you're, you know, an employee um, have, should carry a, a lot of weight, not to mention the unstructured data and the way knowledge is shared and flowed within an organization from a social network and analysis and knowledge graph kind of standpoint, there's, there's gold in there. Yeah. I, so I, I'm going to tie kind of the conversation around talent marketplaces uh, and the skills first thing together. Um, I refer to these talent marketplaces actually as equal opportunity platforms. And it really comes from my history of helping companies design career management systems um, and also seeing how people kind of tend to advance through their organization. And it tends to be, you know, those people who are politically connected, who look like everybody else, are the ones who get access to the kinds of opportunities that help them to develop themselves. Well, a talent marketplace is super cool because it connects people to opportunities based on the skills that they have, not who they know. And so, you know, when people talk about, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, you know, uh, you know, principles within a company, I say, well, you need to have systems and processes that actually facilitate that. You can't train your way to diversity, right? You need systems that create more fairness in your processes. And I think a talent marketplace is one of those things that really does because it's based on the skills that you have. Um, and I love it from that perspective because it really does help everybody both be able to see the opportunities that are available to them, but also to be able to, you know, kind of figuratively raise their hand and express interest in an opportunity that perhaps previously they wouldn't even know about. So I think that's really important from a skills first hiring standpoint. So um, I mentioned I'm the chair of the board for the Sherm Foundation, and we have a very big um, skills first initiative and in helping companies understand that talent strategy um, to hire people who are perhaps skilled through alternative um, sources uh, we're called stars skilled through alternative uh, systems or something. Uh, but the issue is we come out of school today and, you know, I hate to use this example, but I had a cat sitter who had <laughs> a degree in computer science and she couldn't find a job, even though she is a newly minted computer science student, because she didn't actually have the technical skills in particular areas that people were hiring for. So just because you have a degree doesn't mean that you have the skills my company is looking for. So then she was going to a boot camp to, you know, learn how to be a data analyst or learn how to program in Python or whatever it was, uh, learn AI. And people are now getting all these certifications in these areas where we need deep technical talent and skills are changing so quickly in the workplace that we need to widen our aperture of how we access talent. And if we are looking for the skills that we're hiring for and not using proxies like college degree, we can now get access to a broader pool, which turns out to be a more demographically diverse pool of talent because there are a lot of people. It turns out there's something like 62% of U.S. Uh, people who are you know, employable in the U.S. don't have a college degree. So why would you cut out over half of your potential talent pool in a time where you know, we're under one of the greatest labor challenges that we've ever had. We do not have enough people to fill the roles that we have. And I hate to tell you, it's only going to get worse from here if you look out into the future on the demographics. So we need to find other ways of accessing talent and focusing on skills helps us bring people into employment situations that let people rise up. Um, 
based on their initiative in going out and getting these credentials um, or learning skills through, you know, whether it be apprenticeships or other ways. So I'm very passionate, obviously, um, the foundation's doing this work um, to help companies understand that talent strategy, but I'm very pa passionate in helping companies recognize that with the talent shortages that we have, we need new strategies that help us gain access to a broader pool of talent. Yeah, I think there's a lot of things that have to happen simultaneously. One of those is, like you said, casting a much wider net um, and not limiting yourself to uh, anything that would fall prey to, to human, one of many human biases in the process. Um, but I also think you've got to, you know, break down those traditional sort of work structures and the, the mindset around, well, this is, this is how we operate. We want, you know, how are we supposed to enhance our culture or improve the employee experience if, you know, we're hiring contingent labor or we're hiring, you know, whatever, whatever the excuse might be. But the fact is, if you recognize that you have work to be done and you want to bring the most, um, you know, the best available talent in the most optimal way to do that, then you have to open the aperture and you have to look 360 degrees around. So one of the questions I have for you is like, as people think about that and you say, okay, yes, like, okay, you sold me it. We need to start moving towards this internal talent marketplace thing. But what about, you know, who owns that? First of all, is that talent acquisition have some ownership of that? Because technically we're saying we're going to fill roles, not just by, you know, fishing in a new pond, but we're going to look amongst our, our midst and, and potentially fill roles that way. And then you also have the, the contingent labor, you know, freelance contract labor, et cetera, which oftentimes isn't even owned by HR. It's owned by vendor management, which might be under procurement or even, you know, the CIO's office, if it's, technical talent, I don't know, but you have these, now you have people potentially, you know, jockeying for, for a position of who is in charge of what percentage of the net new, you know, labor, or I guess just the dynamics that go with this true workforce ecosystem that break, yeah. tries to break down those, those silos. I mean, how, how have you seen companies try to address that if they, if they have? Uh, not a lot have uh, is the the short answer, but I and I wrote an article about this recently about managing your your talent ecosystem using kind of skills as a means to do a better job of managing your entire uh, talent ecosystem. So I, this is really an issue, you know. Talent acquisitions responsible for hiring new employees. Procurement is responsible for bringing in contract labor. Um, like a, a consulting firm or, or something. And then it turns out that managers are getting so frustrated that they can't, you know, find the talent that they need and the timeline that they need, that they're going out to open platform, talent platforms like uh, TopTal or Upwork. And they're just, you know, hiring contract talent from a talent platform. So it's all over the board and it's inefficient. And to your question, you know, who owns this? Is it talent acquisition? Is it talent management or more specifically learning and development? Because it's actually the, we use our, our, you know, talent marketplace for development purposes, or is it outside of HR altogether? And it's kind of some sort of uh, organization in charge of organization effectiveness, if you're really looking at becoming more agile as a company. Uh, so there are a lot of different hands in the pot. I believe that all those people need to work together and really talent acquisition has to be working and talent acquisition and talent management jointly have to be working with managers to help them understand all the different ways that they can source talent. We can bring in a full-time employee. We can bring in a contractor. We can, you know, that's like kind of hear more full-time on this job or we can hire somebody from a talent platform. And by the way, if these are the skills that you're looking for, these are the specific platforms that you should be looking at because it turns out that these open marketplace talent platforms are becoming really specialized. 
Like this is where you go to find developers. This is where you go to find engineers. You know, this is where you go to find uh, more administrative help or graphics design skills. So we need to look at this more holistically to better manage our entire talent ecosystem and understand financially, like how are we managing this? Sometimes, and there was an article recently um, from Diane Garrison and Linda Groton in Harvard Business Review uh, that, if you will, kind of built on the article that I was talking about that said, you know, there are some people today that have such awesome and high demand skills. They don't want to work for the man. They don't want to work for a company. The only way you're going to be able to access the talent is by hiring them in some sort of on-demand fashion. They work off of a platform. You can hire them to do a project and, and then they'll go away unless you have a really compelling case for them to stay on and do another project. And we need to understand that. And we need to understand sometimes our company needs that talent and that's the only way we're going to access them. You can put that job opening up there and try and hire that person, but not being able to fill that role for three, six, nine, 12 months does not help your company. Understanding how to access that talent is really important. And so, you know, I think that these teams need to come together and they need to develop an entire talent ecosystem strategy and how they collectively work together to get the right talent that helps a company to execute on its strategy. Yeah, no, I think that's critically important. And I have firsthand experience in that situation. Um, I mean, that's what happened when I was I was working as a chief of staff to the VP of software engineering at, at NBC. And it was taking four or six months for me to work through staffing agents, through vendor management, through different staffing agencies, constantly giving them updates on what projects we've got and you know going through interviews and not finding someone i'm like this this is not sustainable like is this what is this how hr works actually i shouldn't even say that because hr uh, at the time talent acquisition just said good luck because we were hiring we did not have uh, approval for full time hiring so talent acquisition just said you know best of luck i said oh okay well we have a, our contracts say if we like this person we can hire them in as soon as a month so Basically, I'm going to come back to you next month and say, we just hired people and they completely bypassed talent acquisition. I just want to make sure you're clear that that's about, that's exactly what's going to happen. So that's where I, my proposal, um, perhaps because subconsciously I was thinking about your book. Um, I was like, this, this is not, this is not working. We need to find resources. There's engineering teams all over the Comcast family of companies. So you can't tell me that there's not a handful of senior software engineers who are, could very well just walk out the door if you don't give them a principal, you know, opportunity to lead a new team in a, in a different domain. And um, so that's one thing. And the other was I was developing automation strategy and I said, well, who are the people that might be most susceptible to d disruption because of that um, automation that we're planning? And can I assess their capability to be reskilled um, in a more technical role, and and let's do all of these things at the same time because otherwise, at the time they were working on Peacock, right, and they had a deadline. They told the public when Peacock was coming out. So, it's like, guys, this isn't just like a self-imposed. Oh, we want to get this done by you know April or whatever. Like, you've told everyone and your shareholders that this streaming service is coming. So you either start thinking about how you add agility to your talent strategy and you think differently about where and how to identify skills and potential or you're going to get disrupted and you're going to lose talent to other you know media and entertainment yeah you know you bring up a really interesting point which is sometimes your employees have skills that they'd like to use and then you bring in a contractor to do that project it's really disheartening when all the really cool projects go to somebody outside of the company. And so, you know, as a means of retaining your top talent, it's giving them the opportunity to, to work on this other exciting new project. I mean, who inside wouldn't want to work on the cool new, you know, Peacock strategy? Uh, 
And we, we so often will just bring in a contractor to work on that. And that doesn't make your existing employees really happy. So I guess that's going to be one of the challenges, not unlike some of the sort of cultural challenges with successfully Im- implementing or adopting a, a talent marketplace, which is if you, if your full-time employees feel like you were too quick to go out and hire net new employees or to bring in that contractor who could be converted at some point if mutually agreed upon to be converted and instead. So you're not giving current employees who have been loyal to the company, supposedly, uh, you're not giving them sort of first right of first refusal um, for some of those jobs. Yeah. One strategy that I really love is from my friends at uh, Tata Communications. Uh, They really focused on how do we build capability within the organization, particularly in these new skill areas where we just don't have it resident within the company. And so they have a very specific strategy called an action learning program. Uh, If they're going to bring in an external contractor, because somebody has those deep special technical skills that we just don't have within the company, they then put in a project team around that person. But as part of the remit of that project is for that contractor to infuse those skills or upskill the other employees in that technical area. So they're learning while doing this important work, right? Right. It's, you know, the whole idea around upskilling your talent, but really specifically being mindful when you're bringing in an external contractor, build the capability internally so that in the future, you don't have to hire that external contractor. You'll have that capability inside the company. And I think that's a very smart talent strategy. No, I I agree. And if, I guess, thinking about, when I think about AI, people sort of gaining AI expertise uh, i guess this will lead into our aiq discussion but but i think there's part part of this is around you know literacy what what can ai do um so that i can use it in my planning and my brainstorming and all of these uh creative ways and and also you you know learning how to use it you know fairly responsibly um but then you've got another angle around the actual the actual skills like to actually, you know, hands to keyboard, learn how to interact, you know, prompt it um, to, to get what you what you need from it and, and things like that. So there's a lot of facets that, that go into this. But but if you can, if you provide that training, first of all, you should do it anyway, because AI is on everyone's device already. So you either teach them how to, it's like giving them their computer for the first time uh, in, you know, the late 80s or whenever it was. Um, but you either give them the tools to, use it and use it responsibly and i guess i where i'm going is that's you can almost nudge everyone in the right direction and make them more competitive by doing the the upskilling or or the reskilling or whatever with ai um, you make them more competitive and then you don't have to then the organization will be less likely to look outside especially if they're looking for ai um, you know literacy and, and ai skills because you know people have taken the initiative they had a learning mindset and they put themselves with our help they put themselves on this path that said i will not be disrupted i I really like what i do i know i can do it even better with ai and i'm going to position myself so maybe you don't want to go external or maybe so your smart super smart algorithms can detect that we have the skills internally that we need and, and we can be you know, we've already taught ourselves how to fish, so you don't have to go start over. Yeah. Um, so, so on that, on that, since I since I teed it up there, um, when you when you saw the title of my podcast here, elevate your AIQ. What what are some things that came came to mind? You know, I have a personal mantra, which is always be learning, um, and I think elevating your AIQ is really about being curious. It's about taking the opportunity to being, you know, kind of willing to experiment with what is this AI tool? What can it do for me? Um, I'm one of those firm believers that uh, AI is not coming for your job, but the person using AI 
is a person who's coming for your job, right? It's a, it's a, a enhancer to us. It's augmented intelligence. It's not artificial intelligence, it's not taking away, but it's augmenting, you know, kind of what you do. So I think really looking, um, looking for the specific tools that will help you do what you do better might be faster. So I know everyone's really focused on productivity, but you know, the deep experts that I know in AI say, yes, there's a productivity piece to this, but it's really more about better decision making. It's about um, having a tool that will help me think critically. Um, so, you know, it's about breaking work down and figuring out where do I add the most value in this work equation? And what's just kind of a routine thing? I, I love, uh, I had a, a conversation with the um, head of HR at Microsoft and they said th they talk about using um, their co-pilot solution, you know, to um, uh, to remove the toil and bring more joy to your work. Like, what is it about your work that is just like, oh my god, I have to do that task again? Maybe that task uh, can be automated, and so you can remove the toil from your work, so that you can spend time doing things that bring you more joy that, you know, I love solving problems. So how can I use the technology to help me solve problems better? Um, but also how do I remove the more administrivia from my day-to-day -day work so that I can focus more of the time where I truly do add value. And so I think elevating your AIQ is both, it's, it's the knowledge about what tools are available to you. It's being curious to, and experimenting with it to see um, what you can do. Yeah, no, it, I think that's great. Yeah, I, I harp on this productivity thing. I mean, I know everyone wants to be more productive and being more productive makes you look good and whatever, but uh, in some ways I feel like I've said this to couple people but i just feel like individual productivity when we know we all work in in teams as part of a, of a broader mission it just i don't know to me it just looks like a vanity metric kind of thing well you know I, i'm gonna share like a real specific example of how i'm using ai to use my time better which is i'm looking for these tools that just make things work smoother and easy. Yes, I use ChatGPT, you know, occasionally create an outline for a, a training. Not that I need the outline, but sometimes that outline makes me think of something that I wasn't initially going to put in my outline. You know, so it's, I, I use it as an, I, you know, to spark an idea. But I, um, I've now connected a Calendly, you know, and they're at, thousand of these. So I don't mean to promote anybody's particular product, but, you know, a calendar uh, system with my, with my Zoom, I use Zoom, other people use Teams or whatever. But now when somebody wants to schedule a meeting with me, I used to go back and forth. What dates do you have available? No, I'm not available on those dates. What dates, other dates do you have available? And it kind of takes time, go back and forth. And then, you know, finally agree on something. Now I have to go into my Zoom account and I have to like set up the meeting and then I have to send you a meeting invite. Now I send somebody a link to my calendar. They make an appointment and it automatically sets up that, you know, so it's just, it's something simple, but it, it really does free up minutes. It's not hours of my time, but now I can spend my time doing things where I add more value and I don't have to focus on that administrative part. Um, I spend a lot of time listening to webinars. You know, I like you, Bob, you know, think of myself as a thought leader, but you can't be a thought leader if you're not hearing kind of the latest and greatest of what's coming out from other people as well. And it's really important for me to stay up to date, but I'm spending so much time reading research reports, spending time on webinars where I'm just looking for those one or two nuggets, right? 
So now I'm sending my AI agent to those webinars um, and it gives me a summary and I can figure out my key points from that summary. That frees up an hour of my time. Uh, so it, it's really about understanding where the technology can do something. You know, you think of it as another employee. Um, sometimes you might have an intern who's doing some research for you. I can ask my AI agent to do that research for me. Um, that will make it faster, trust but verify, even an intern makes mistakes, so you always got to verify everything. Um, but I, I just kind of went on and on. But I, I think it is really possible that we can use AI to make ourselves not only more efficient and increase productivity, but also be able to spend time on the things that bring you more joy and let you use your human skills more. Yeah, no, I... I'm glad you I'm glad you went there because as you're talking, I'm just thinking, you know, my statement is I guess more for a worker inside an organization where they're they're part of a team. So imagine you're you've got a workflow with, you know, it hits, you know, four other crisscrosses four other roles in, in your, your swim lane, you know, process map. Um, if you're working at five X, you know, speed, but everyone else is still at normal speed then the end to end, you know, value creation isn't necessarily occurring, right? So that's why it'd be great if everybody sort of, you know, improved their own, um, you know, throughput and, but, you know, with quality and, you know, the accuracy and, and effectiveness as well. But, but you're right. I mean, as a, as a independent advisor, solopreneur, there's a lot of things that I just, there's literally just not enough hours in the day. So if there are, or calls, like you said, if there's calls that you need to be on, but you also have, you know, deadlines with the client or what have you, you can't be at two places at once. Then absolutely, as long as the the host of that webinar doesn't kick you out for having your your AI there and and you're not there, so it's not really your co-pilot; it's your digital twin, if you will. But um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of use cases where it it absolutely makes sense. And the other thing about, I guess, the shortcoming of productivity, like just because it saves you. Five minutes, that may not sound like a lot, but first of all, if you scale that and it's five minutes uh, every hour or whatever, right, It's it really adds up. The other is it doesn't account, the productivity um, metric doesn't account for potentially the frustration level with that five minutes. Like how, like why didn't you accept the th one of the five time windows that I gave you? You got to come back with a sixth option. So now it's another back and forth. So Sometimes the time alone doesn't even tell you uh, how much your your mind could be more at ease if some of those things were off your plate. So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot that AI can do for us if we learn to work with it. And I'm really, I, personally, I'm just, I'm diving in. I'm trying to figure it out. Um, and I'm excited, uh, you know, about the possibilities. I do think it's going to change the way we work, but, you know, uh, you know, they, they talk about eliminating jobs. You know, I, I think they, in some cases, we might have fewer positions, but people have deep domain expertise and we need that domain expertise, even guided with additional tools that can help us do stuff. Like I'm really excited now. I can create my own graphics because I know how to use mid journey, you know, but and um, somebody who is a graphics designer will be far better at that task than me because they have a vision. Uh, they, they have a creative skill set. I, I just don't have. I'm a scientist by training. I'm not a creative person. And so those people inherently need to be in that role still aided by the technology. But um there, it's just, it's a very exciting time to see what we can do better, maybe faster. Um, and again, how we spend more time doing the things where we truly add value. You think of, you know, a customer service job can be so improved by the, a by, uh, the access to AI technology that can help them get access to the right answers quickly for customers, it improves the customer experience, it improves the employee experience, 
there's just so many great examples out there about hey, how AI can make work better. I think it's a very exciting time. I completely agree. Edie, it has been a pleasure as always. That's about all the time we have for today. Um, but thank you so much for coming on and sharing your perspective. It was really informative and insightful. So thank you. I always love talking to you, Bob. Anytime. I hope this was helpful for your listeners. Excellent. Thank you, everyone, for uh, listening to another episode of Elevate Your AIQ. We will see you next time. Thank you again, Edie.